please be seated. Psalms, Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2. Before I recite this, I'd like to just say one thing. The psalmist, and this psalmist is believed to be Solomon, wants us to know that, that though we are asked to work, it is the Lord who establishes whatever we work on. We will find success if we build based on the principles of God. We will stay safe if we put our trust in God rather than what our eyes can see and what our hands can touch. And I apologize, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I had written it down, so I'm gonna do this. It may not be exactly the words that are on the screen. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to the ones he loves. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Brian. Psalm 127 is known as a, a song of ascent. It's one of about 15 psalms that were often sung as the people were heading up to the high mountain of Jerusalem to worship on the great feast days. And so they'd go up the mountain and they'd be singing these psalms of praise to God. It's also thought that, that at times the priests who were going into the temple to serve would sing this or some of the other psalms and a different psalm on each step. It was their way of preparing their hearts and getting ready to worship God. God, the creator. God, the one who they served daily. You know, work has been something that we talk about all the time. And on this Labor Day, I thought, well, I'd, I'd preach a little bit on this and maybe ask that question, who are you working for? You know, there was a day where they would say, I'm working for the man. Uh, I don't know if that's politically correct anymore, but, you know, it, it symbolizes you're working for some big company or a big corporation. And many people begin to look at their lives as the product of that working that they did. But you know, sometimes the work was not so productive. People were busy, but they weren't really feeling that they were doing something that made a difference. And maybe you've noticed the fact that when you ask the question, how are you, especially nowadays, people say, oh, I'm, I'm so busy, or I'm pretty busy, or we've been going in a hundred different directions, especially as we come to the end of the summer where people have been traveling, they've been going to the beach, they've been doing family visitations, and, and then there's the work obligations as well. And so everybody seems to be busy. It, it's almost, though, like we need to justify the fact that we've been working hard because there's something within us that, that wants people to know that we're doing something good, we're doing something productive. When people tell me that they haven't been to church lately, guess what the number one thing I hear is this, well, we've just been so busy, Pastor. <laughs> uh, we've been just running here and there, and the kids have had this, and the kids have had that, and, and we've had these obligations. Well, Samuel Gumpers, the longtime president of the American Federation of Labor, that's the AFL, before it was CIO, um, said, Labor Day differs in every essential way from the other holidays of the year in any country. While we set aside this weekend as a national tribute to the contribution that laborers have made to our country's strength, growing up, it always meant to me the end of summer. And isn't that true? That, that Labor Day means, okay, we're going to get back to the regular routine. If we've had a chance to rest and get away from our labors, now we're going back to work. We're going back to school. We're going back to our daily routines and the busyness that accompanies all of that. And isn't it interesting that we celebrate work by taking a day off or an extended weekend? Our scripture today, Psalm 127, is, is, is a, a working psalm. It was one, like I mentioned, that was sung as people were going up to worship the Lord, to work in the temple. 
And as they were going, they sang this song. It's kind of like the one that I've heard people sing as they go back to work. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work I go. Maybe that was the seven dwarfs only. I'm not sure. But it was that kind of thing where they would sing and it would be joyful because they were going to serve and worship the Lord. But in all seriousness, this psalm suggests that unless we are working for the Lord... Our work is in vain. And we're not just talking about preachers here. We're not just talking about Christian educators. We're talking about every one of us. Unless we are working for the Lord, unless whatever we're doing is dedicated to God, then there's a sense of vanity within it. And again, if you know, Brian said this psalm was written by Solomon. Solomon, who wrote some of the great Proverbs, talks about in the book of Ecclesiastes how everything he's done seems to be vanity until he realizes that unless he does it for the Lord, it has no meaning, no significance, no value. You see, our work is so much a part of our lives that when you strike up a conversation with a stranger, one of the first questions they ask is, what do you do for a living? You see, because our work tends to define us. Why do you think that there's been such an emphasis on recategorizing various jobs? You know, you used to call things what they were. But now, if your son works as a sanitation engineer, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? My son's an engineer. He's a sanitation engineer. In the olden days, they would call, call him a garbage man, right? But we changed that name to give it some dignity. Or how about this one? Now, now again, I don't go to the local bars and taverns, but, but if you went into one recently, you would find that the chief beverage officer is a bartender. Doesn't that sound good? He's the chief beverage officer. He, he's the one who handles all the beverages. Yeah, he's a bartender, okay? Or, or what about this one? If you've been to the doctor's office lately or you've been to a business, you probably have met the first impressions director. That's a pretty good title, right? That's what they used to call a secretary. For, but now she's a director or he's a director. You know, we all want our lives to count for something. And work is where many of us find our significance because we spend so much time at the office, at the shop, in the school, in the market, wherever we work. Even a few thousand years ago, that was true. And the psalmist suggests that unless we understand what we're doing is something that brings glory to God, we'll never be completely satisfied with our work. Yet our culture is kind of mixed up when it comes to work. Maybe you've seen some of these bumper stickers along the way. I, I like them. The, the first one says, work fascinates me. I can sit and watch it for hours. Or how, how about this one? You may agree with this one. And I, I, I picked on Paul earlier. I'm going to pick him again. Paul is a fisherman now, commercial fisherman. And this one, the worst day of fishing is better than the best day of working. Right? You could, I've heard that said, the, the worst day of golfing is better than the best day of working. Uh, or this one, I like this one. Hard work may not kill me, but why take the chance? <laughs> you know, on the other hand, we have in our society, we have people who are workaholics. They work all the time. They work 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Their whole life is about their work. Their family and, and their worship and everything else comes second because they've got to get the work done. And that's become almost like their idol because it, it, it consumes them. And every minute of the day, we were watching a movie the other night uh, called, what was it, Fa Like Father? And, and Kelsey Grammer and, uh, and somebody else. <laughs> Uh, Kristen Wiig, was it Wig? Yeah. And, and so th this woman had her phone all the time and wherever she went, she was on a vacation cruise and she's, she's on there and she's on her phone calling the office. And, and it was real shame. You could see how someone could get so tied up. Her life was falling apart. She was jilted at the altar because her work was everything. So we have workaholics, and then we have others who avoid work at all costs. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe there's someone in your family like that. You say, hey, I've got a job to do. I'll give you some money. Oh, no, that's all right. I'm, all, I'm fine. Or you say, hey, have you got a job yet? Ho, oh, ho, don't tell me yet. And in the middle, there's the majority of the people today that follow the philosophy of another bumper sticker that goes like this. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. We work to pay the bills. You know, Homer, the famous Greek writer, said that the gods hated humans so much that they invented work as a way to punish people. And some of you may know that feeling, or you know people who believe that. 
with some people, while some people love their jobs, others can't stand what they do for a living. They always want to get out of there and, and it just burdens them. Now, our work should never take first place in our lives because work is a terrible determiner of our sense of worth. Yet the Bible teaches that work does have intrinsic value. That's where the Protestant work ethic came from. To work is a good thing, to be productive, to make a difference in what we're doing. And the Bible says that God values work. In Genesis 1.1, it states that God created the heavens and the earth. And Genesis 2.2 calls this activity of creation work. It says on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested. So God works. God values work. A second reason is God calls us to be his co-laborers. Our work is to be with the Lord. Genesis 1.26 says the man is to have dominion over creation. Genesis 2.15 states that Adam was placed in the garden to work it and keep it. God planted the garden and man cultivated it. And this partnership continues today. We work and we work with God. 1 Corinthians 3.9 says, For we are God's fellow workers. You see, that's what our calling is, is to work with God in the world. No matter what our vocation is, no matter what our calling is, no matter what our career is, our calling, we were created to work with God. The Hebrew word for work, interesting enough, is also the same word used for worship. Now, some of you would say, oh, you don't know my job. It's far from worship. But when we talk about work, it was always meant to be a way that we worship God. Or another, another um, interpretation of that word is service. Another way to work is serving God. God has always intended that our work and our worship be a seamless way of living. Adam worshiped God by doing the work he was given to do. And we, when we labor out of love for our Lord, we put on display the genius of God who created each of us uniquely to reflect His beauty. While we, when we work in concert with God, according to our giftedness and abilities, God is glorified and we're fulfilled because that's what He made us to do. Tragically, the entrance to sin in Genesis 3 uh, wrecked this partnership. It was distorting what work is. And the challenge for us is to recognize that even though labor can be hard and challenging, we've been designed to work in tandem with God, not just for ourselves. When we were down in Kentucky on the mission trip, there was this fellow who was there, and, and that's what he did. He was, he was a missionary. He looked at himself as a missionary, but what he did was hard labor. He's the one who carried the bags of cement. He's the one who carried the cinder blocks. He's the one who lifted the boards and the plywood, and he looked at that as working for the Lord. You know, there's a story told about three men who were digging the foundation of a great cathedral in Europe. And so they asked the first man, they said, what are you doing? And the first man replied that he was earning money to feed his family. He was digging that trench, he was preparing the ground for the foundation, and he was doing that so that he had money so that he could take care of his family. And that's noble. Many of us work for that reason. The second man, though, he said, I'm doing this so I can have some extra money so I can go out and party. You know, we know people like that too, right? They only work so that they, they work for the weekends. But the third man, as he was digging the trench to build the foundation, he said, I'm here today building a cathedral for the glory of God. All doing the same work, but they looked at that work very differently. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. put it like this, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted. Or Beethoven composed music. Or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lives the greatest street sweeper who did his job well. You know, it reminds me, when I went to Australia in 2008, I wanted to go to the Hillsong Church. Uh, it was a great church, if you've heard of Hillsong music and preaching and whatnot. And so I, I had to take a taxi. I got there early, and, and because I was there a half an hour before the service, I kind of wandered around, looked at everything, and then I went into the restroom. And, and when I went into the restroom, there was a fella in there, and he was swishing the toilets and cleaning the toilets, and he was singing a praise song. And I, I said to him, I said, 
boy, I tell you, you got the dirty job. How can you be so happy about it? And he says, I'm cleaning toilets for the Lord. And I thought, boy, what a way to look at it. Even the dirtiest, yuckiest jobs, if you do it for the Lord, they can bring joy and meaning to your heart. When we work with God, allowing the Lord to do His bidding through us, we find that we are doing something significant. It's not just toil. Work should bring us satisfaction. My dad worked at Pratt & Whitney for 40 years and he hated every day. He made a good pay, he was able to support his family, but every day he went in and he hated that job. But you know what? He came home and he had a big garden. And we had horses for a while and then we had cows. And when he came home, he went out into his garden and he weeded and he planted and he sowed all the vegetables that were there. And then he went out to the cow barn and he shucked the stalls where the cows were. And I remember he always asked me to help. And I was a teenager. Nobody likes to pull weeds. Well, forgive me. Some of us don't like to pull weeds and garden, and most of us do not want to be cleaning out stalls. But my dad got great joy out of that. And I think as I look back on it, it was that creative process of planting the garden and watching it grow and seeing the fruit come up. He recognized the fact that God was in this. And that is where he found his satisfaction and his value. And the truth is, is that when we're doing something and we give it to God and we're working with God, we find our satisfaction there too. In verse 2 of this psalm, we see a picture of unhealthy desperation. It's in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. You know, the psalmist here is describing someone who's all stressed out, someone like my dad, and not enjoying what he has. The term anxious toil has to do with the emotional and physical pain that we suffer when we hate what we do. Solomon wrote something similar in Ecclesiastes 2. What is a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This is vanity. You see, when you're working for the wrong motivation... You can't sleep at night. Sometimes you can't eat and your life is filled with stress. Ecclesiastes 5, 12 says this, Sweet is the sleep of the laborer. The commentator Moffat puts it this way, God's gifts come to his loved ones as they sleep and so as you're serving and working for the Lord, you're able to rest easy at night because you know you've done a good thing. Unless our labor is for the Lord, our lives will be empty. When we work for the Lord, we find our significance, our security, and our satisfaction. So here's my advice for you on this Labor Day. And I know some of you are retired, but that doesn't matter because even if you're retired, somebody is calling you to do something, right? It could be your wife or your husband asking you to do something. It could be your children or grandchildren who are calling on you to do something that, that could be considered work for them. So here we go. Worship while you work. I'm not talking about singing a praise song, but to know when you go into work that I'm going to serve the Lord today. Make time each day to give thanks and to dedicate your labor to the Lord. Use the day to be a light in the darkness so that those you work with will be blessed. That's where most of us spend the majority of our time, at work. You know, we know the difference. There are people who hate their jobs and they make life miserable for us. But we should be different because as we work and serve the Lord, there should be a light that radiates out of us so that everyone we work with sees that. There, there's a story that reminds me of what a difference you can make. Uh, there was a dad who, who took his daughter to take your daughter to work day, and the daughter was all excited. She got up in the morning. This was the day she was finally going to go to see where dad worked, and she went in, and she spent the whole day with him, and they were in the car coming home, and, and he looked in the mirror, and he saw her, and she had a frown on her face, and, and he says, uh, well, didn't you have a nice day with daddy at work, he said? Well, it was okay, but I thought it would be more like a circus, and her dad said, what? What, what, do you, what do you mean? And she said, well, you always said that you work with a bunch of clowns, and I never got to see them at all today. <laughs> Maybe you work with clowns. Those clowns you work with need you 
to do the work that God gave you to do. Those students in your classroom need to be served. You know, you can look at yourself as a missionary cleverly disguised as an employee. I love, when we went to Oklahoma on the mission trip, we left the worship center that day, and at the end of the driveway, there was a sign. And I want to put one out here, and I'm going to. One of these days, you're going to see it. And it says, you are now entering the mission field. You see, a mission field is not over in India or down in South America or in the deep heart of Africa. The mission field, Billy Graham said the greatest mission field in the world is the United States. There's a darkness that sometimes settles over our communities and our nation. And we're called to be the light. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And when you go to work and you look at your work as a sense of serving and glorifying God, when you're working for the Lord, It changes everything. And it may just change some of the people you work with as well. Don't make your job an idol. Don't look to find your identity there. Look to God to find your identity. Significance, security, and satisfaction comes from looking at your work that way. The word vocation actually comes from the word voca, which means to call. And I believe that God has called all of us to serve Him wherever we are. Not just the minister in the church, but you as a nurse, you as a a cashier, you as a teacher, you as a nurse, you as as a bagger in the grocery store. You're called to serve. If you want to find worth in your work, view your job as a calling. A calling recognizes that we're working with God to accomplish His purposes. So work hard at whatever you do and know for sure that when you give God the glory, you're working for God. Amen. Our closing song as we prepare to come to the Lord's table is, O Master, let me walk with Thee. We're going to sing the first and second verses, number 651, and also on the screens. First and second verse. be seated. Josh Ballesteros has been meeting with me in baptism classes and sometime in October Josh will be baptized and this past week we were talking about the Lord's Supper and what it means and the difference between how some other traditions look at this meal. The truth is all of us believe and understand that Jesus died and took the place of all of us who have sinned. And on the cross, He died, and with Him, forgiveness became ours. We also know that His blood was shed, but in the shedding of His blood, He said there was a new covenant. And in this new covenant, this new agreement with God, that we would now not have to fear death, because with Him, we would rise again and be with Him forever. And so in this simple ceremony, we take the bread and we remember the sacrifice that He made. His body was broken for you and for me. We don't have to face that punishment anymore because He paid the price, a dear price, with His life. With His blood, which represents His life, He gave His life, His blood was shed, 
And in that, like in so many covenants, that blood was meant to seal a new covenant. Throughout the Old Testament and the New, God has made many covenants and agreements with His people. And this is the lasting, most significant of all the covenants. He said, if you believe in Me, then My blood will cover you just like the Passover blood covered the ancient Israelites. And you will not have to fear death, for even if you die, yet shall you live. All those who live and believe in Me will never truly die. And so we come to the table today reflecting upon our own failings, our own shortcomings. We ask His forgiveness again and we know that it's granted because of what He did. This table does not belong to this church and so you do not have to be a member in order to participate in the Lord's Supper here. But it will only have meaning if you understand the significance of what we're doing. Otherwise, it's just bread and juice. But if you come, know that you are forgiven. Your past is no longer there to bind you. That now you can live to the glory of God, work to the glory of God. And you need not fear even when sickness comes into your life. For there will be life beyond life as we take the cup and we remember. And so I invite you now to come. The Apostle Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed. And you hear that word? The night He was betrayed? He knew it was coming. And yet He took that bread, and he, when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It was the third cup of the Passover meal, the cup of blessing, the cup of hope and promise. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Participating in the Lord's Supper is an act of faith. And it's telling the world that we believe and we have hope for the future. And so as we come to the table today, we're going to do as Jesus did on that day. We're going to pray over the bread and then we're going to pray over the cup and share it with one another. One of the deacons now is going to pray for the bread.